Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session all about teaching intercultural listening. We're going to be talking about both research and best practices in this particular vein of research. Uh, my name is Sharon Chayden Glass. I'm an instructional media designer for the e-learning division at Sinclair Community College. Before I started this job last September, I taught ESL for 13 years in intensive English programs and in higher education. So I primarily draw upon my experiences in that work to inform this presentation. During my time as an ESL teacher, I coordinated many partnerships with other university departments to create mutually beneficial intercultural exchanges, which is what led me to the field of intercultural communication. And now I'll let my uh, colleague Jennifer introduce herself. Hello everyone and thank you for attending our virtual session. This is the first time uh, we've done a virtual session together so it's very exciting but also very new. Um, a little bit about me, I am a doctoral candidate and senior lecturer at Boston University. As a senior lecturer I teach in global programs where I work with international students who are preparing for full matriculation to university. I also help out with the intercultural communication course that we teach there for master's level students who are already fully matric matriculated into our programs. I also hold a master's degree in intercultural communication from Lesley University, and I've been in the field now for about 20 years. Um, so it's very exciting to be with you today and exciting to be following up with Sharon, whom I met last year at TESOL 2019. So today um, we'll be taking a look at what exactly do we mean when we talk about listening competence to begin when we think about international learners or uh, English language learners acquiring skills and then we'll meddle that up with a lot of what does it mean to think about intercultural competence and we think about that more in the terms of a multilingual multicultural context and what are some class activities for developing intercultural listening skills. We probably won't have time for this, but another question to consider is what are other important considerations when developing and implementing intercultural activities. So let's first start with kind of the broad brushstrokes on the next slide, please. Before we get started today, just out of curiosity, how many of you are teaching in some kind of intercultural or multicultural classroom? And as you think about that classroom, whether it's face-to-face -face or virtual, I'm wondering on a scale of one to 10, how important is developing intercultural competence and how important is it to engage in intercultural communication to you in that classroom context, whether it's remote learning or face-to-face. -face. So just, just kind of a think about a question before we proceed. So let's start here by unpacking the first big question here, what is listening competence? So our goal in the presentation is to raise our awareness about how complex listening really is. And then we'll see when we add the aspect of intercultural communi communication to listening, it gets even more complex. So first let's just take a moment and think about what it is that we mean when we say listening competence. And let me ask you, what does listening competence mean to you? All right, and now let's take a look at what some second language acquisition uh, researchers and experts say about this question. So the big question now is what do we already know about L2 listening? Well, we can think about it as a process, a very complex process that involves both cognitive, metacognitive, and sociocultural aff affective processes. Now, a lot of the research on the left-hand side of our screen focuses on the cognitive aspects of listening. More notably, we see a lot of research that takes a look at top-down skills, background knowledge of the listener, bottom-up skills, how they decode, how they parse, how they can tell where word boundaries are, and of course, the real process of listening is very interactive. So we have quite a bit of research that's very heavily uh, loaded in the cognitive realm. And then in the next point on the continuum in the middle of the slide, we have a lot of metacognitive studies, Go, 
2014 and GO 2012. She's really led a lot of the research in this. And that's where, as you're listening and learning to listen, you think about what strategies am I using? And how am I doing? And what am I already good at? Or what do I feel really nervous about? Which brings us to the sociocultural affective piece, which we have far less research on. So that link between L2 listening and sociocultural frames for learning is a little more sparse. So it kind of begs the question, you know, what can it look like in an intercultural com uh, context, right? Because to be competent in listening doesn't mean just um, thinking about how a learner can handle cognitively a certain load. It also means they need to think about um, how they think about themselves as learners or as listeners, how they interact with others, and other factors like anxiety and motivation, and how those might affect their ability to listen effectively. So when we think about communication, right, we have the listening part, but a lot of the research has also focused on the role of L2 speaking. So we have some studies, one by Baker, 2014, and a separate one by Cooper, 2017, that explored what language teachers think and believe about the role of pronunciation when teaching oral language skills. And the findings from their study showed that perception skills are really key for effective pronunciation. Another point that we found out about is that effective discourse strategies are really important and need to be explicitly taught for discussion skills. Holmes, 2004, did a study and found that participants in the study needed strategies for the dialogic nature of classroom communication or remote communication. Otherwise, they experienced difficulties in listening, understanding, and interacting. And finally, we also have a study by Kaplan and Stevens 2017 that supports the idea that speaking clearly is very important in the role of intercultural communication. And their study, they found that oral communication skills, especially the ability to engage in discussions and participate in group work, were equally or if not more important to international students than reading and writing skills, which are traditionally the academic skills we focus on in academia. So taken together, L2 speaking certainly supports intercultural communication. But there's still a gap, right? These are studies that have looked at the role of speaking in intercultural communication, but what we know about what composes listening competence an intercultural communication through an L2 um, listening lens still remains an open question. Okay, so what do we know so far, right? We do know that there's been some research on intercultural listening. What does intercultural listening really look like? Um, we don't know enough. It's pretty sparse so far. And because it's so sparse, it remains a pretty nebulous concept. We can see that some researchers have tried to explore cultural concepts of listening in order to compare notions of listening across cultures. So Purdy and Manning, 2015, recognize that there's a dearth of scholarship on the role of listening in intercultural communications research. And other researchers have shown that early attempts to categorize cultural concepts of listening in order to compare notions of listening across cultures um, were needed. And finally, we have Strasoda, I hope I'm pronouncing Starosta. it right. Starosta. Starosta and Chen yeah. in 2000. Thank you, Sharon. Yep. Um, who did a study on, or wrote a paper on trying to define and describe what intercultural listening is and what it might look like. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Sharon, who's going to take a deeper look at this. And I ask you to circle back again to that question then, what is intercultural competence? All right, excellent. So at this point, we're going to pivot to intercultural competence. I'm going to ask you to consider what it means to be interculturally competent. So in the next few slides, I'm going to quickly go over some major theories within intercultural competence and communication. 
And my goal is to give you some frameworks to understand how the activities that we provide at the end of the session support both the development of listening and intercultural competence. So um, to begin, one of the most widely known and cited models of developing intercultural competence uh, was put forth by Deerdorf. And it's, her model is called the process model of intercultural competence. And in what I want to draw your attention to is really that she sees it as at the macro level. It, this is a lifelong process. And it starts with having the requisite attitudes, which are respect, openness, and curiosity. We use those attitudes to build our cultural knowledge as we interact with people from other cultures. We develop an awareness of our own culture. We develop our intercultural communication skills in those interactions. And then as we reflect on those interactions, we're able to, re, um, to shift our frame of reference and take on other perspectives. And when we do that, we are able to have more effective and more appropriate um, behavior cross cultures, which then again, feeds into having more respect, more openness and more curiosity. Um, and so what I want you to take away from this is that she really sees the development of intercultural confidence as a lifelong process that is never, that never ends. Another, um, another model to consider is Ting Tumi and Chung's staircase model of intercultural communication competence. And they offer the staircase model to help people visualize intercultural competence development as a series of steps um, in which people become more aware of their intercultural competence. So example, at the, for example, the lowest stage is simply not even being aware <laughs> that you're interculturally incompetent. Um, now, for a lot of us who are teaching English learners who are living in uh, the context for, for like our ESL learners um, specifically, they, we have learners who are incompetent uh, in, in their ability to understand how to behave in, in the target culture, but they're in the process of learning they're aware that they need to build their skills. And so they are conscious that they are incompetent interculturally. And that can be a very, very frustrating place. We also may have learners who are at the conscious competence stage, which means that they are aware of the rules and they, are, um, they know how to engage in the target culture, but they have to actively think about it. And then the final stage is unconscious competence, meaning uh, you don't have to think anymore about how to behave in the target culture. Um, so those, uh, so that kind of tells you about these, how they envision cult intercultural competence as being a series of steps. And Sharon, I just want to jump in to piggyback mm -hmm. off this slide. This is a visual you can easily write on the board. I often show this to students as I'm teaching a new skill just to help them conceptualize where they're at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it helps students because it makes them feel better that they're not just failing. That's the worst feeling in the world is to feel like I can't function in this culture, <laughs> you know, but if you put it in terms of you're on a progression, you are making progress. I think that that that's incredibly motivating. Thanks for bringing that up. Ting Tumi, Ting Tumi and Chung also have a process model like Deerdorf, but the difference in their model is that they really focus on the specific intercultural interaction. So it's a much more microscopic view of what happens in intercultural exchanges. Um, so in their model, they focus on specific intercultural interactions and they deconstruct what is happening within that space. And what they point out is that when people come into an intercultural space, they both have expectations about who the other person is and what each other is trying to convey. Um, and that negotiation of meaning is also filtered through our expectations um, and what happens within language, which as we know is highly symbolic. So there's a lot of opportunities for miscommunication 
and it's so very critically so very critical for people who want to be want to develop their intercultural competence to be aware of how uh, how their lens is influencing their experience within an intercultural situation. So uh, I think we're seeing how complex intercultural communication really is. Now to add even more to that complexity, we can view intercultural competence through the lens of hybrid theory and third culture theory, which view the intercultural interaction in terms of cultural and intercultural space. Hybrid theory helps us understand that in an age of increasing global migration and cultural diversity in physical spaces, cultural boundaries are much less defined as they were in the past. People are increasingly identifying with multiple cultural identities and lenses. We don't always fit perfectly into culture A or culture B. Sometimes we're a bit of both. So similarly, third culture theory helps us understand that effective interlocutors move toward a space between cultures where they can more fully engage in cultural perspective taking and reach agreement on an interpretation that belongs to neither party. So in terms of what this means in your classroom, think about the cultural and intercultural spaces in your classroom, between your students, between you and your students, um, and as you'll see in the activities that we're sharing with you today, a lot of practice in intercultural listening happens in dialogue with each other. As a teacher, your creativity comes into play as you think about how to create authentic and meaningful intercultural experiences for your learners. And also remember, space isn't just physical. It's cultural space. It's social. So consider that as you set up your classroom space in a way to facilitate multilingual language learning. All right, so now we're going to share some activities that you can do in your classroom to help your students develop intercultural listening skills. And the first one I have for you is by uh, Berardo and Deardorff. Um, basically what you do is you, you can put this on a board or you can hand out little slips of paper with this printed on it. And the statement is, I am blank, but that doesn't mean blank. And the example that I've given students in the past is, um, I, am, I am an American, but that doesn't mean I own a gun. <laughs> so I'm kind of um, addressing a stereotype that people might have about Americans. So it helps me differentiate myself as an individual apart from the culture that I belong to. Um, so it's, it's raising learners awareness of their own culture. Um, it's giving students the opportunity to address some of the stereotypes that they think that the other people in the room might have about them. Um, and, and doing it in a safe way because everyone's kind of disclosing something about themselves that they want to share. Um, and I think this is great as an icebreaker, um, if you're, especially if you're going to use it in a series of intercultural dialogues with the same group of learners. It doesn't require much planning. It allows your students to engage in that active identity formation. And like I said before, they get to select and share what they want with the group according to their level of comfort. Um, and it also drives home the point that we all want to be understood. We all want to be valued as individuals. Now this particular activity connects well with hybrid and third culture theory. It takes those concepts and it puts it in a framework that's easy for learners to understand. The fact that they can be part of a culture but also not fully embody all of the common notions or beliefs that people have about a culture. It helps learners see that there can be incredible variation in individuals that all belong to the same culture and all understand the rules of that culture. Um, so, and it helps them understand that when you belong to a culture, it's not necessarily that you follow the rules, it means that you know what the rules are. Everyone has the ability to bend or break those rules, but when you share a culture with someone, you know what the rules are. 
Um, and you can also see how this activity connects to Ting Tumi and Chung and their model of intercultural communication and how we come to the intercultural situation with expectations about the other. Did you have anything to add, Jennifer? Oh, I think that's okay. great. It's good to link some of the theories to the actual classroom activities. And yeah. if you have it more advanced students or graduate level students, you can also do this in the form of a journal entry later on post. Oh, definitely. Yeah, and I think if you did a journal entry, they would have more opportunity to reflect more deeply about what, why they chose that and why that's important for them to differentiate themselves. Uh, my second activity is uh, sharing reflective journals. So this activity requires a little more planning in that learners need to reflect and write before they engage in the intercultural situation. Um, you know, and that part is necessary because as I showed in Deardorff's process model, reflection creates that metacognitive space where learners are going to be able to make more strides in shifting their cultural frame of reference. Um, and so for, for this, I think that it's pretty open to what kind of prompts you give them as long as it's making them think more critically about um, their, how they understand their own culture, maybe cultural miscommunications that they've had and why that happened. Um, and then when they meet together and in, in small groups and are talking to each other, again, they it's important to give them control over deciding what they share because it can be kind of intimidating to talk about um, mis cultural miscommunications. And my final classroom activity, um, Jen has also done this and I'll, I'll let her talk um, in a little bit about her experience with it. I've done this uh, with several different um, classes, lots of different students. Uh, it comes from Burrard or in Deerdorf. It's their values continuum. So the idea is that you post uh, signs with statements of cultural values on opposite sides of the room. And then you ask students to reflect on those statements and go to the side of the room that best represents their cultural value. You can also ask them to stand along an invisible line. So oftentimes you'll have students be, to be like, oh, I don't, it's not like one or the other, I'm kind of in the middle, you know. And so then you can allow for that variation. Oh, okay, well, well, where on this line would you stand? And if you, if you give them that opportunity, more of them are gonna be able to um, differentiate themselves and feel comfortable with where they're standing. Because usually people don't wanna be on totally one side or the other. And then you repeat this process again for other statements with, of cultural values. So let me show you some examples of what those would look like. And these are all from Berardo and Deerdorf. And um, I've used all of these in the classroom. And I think that uh, they started some really great conversations. Uh, I don't think any of them were particularly controversial, which is kind of nice if you're starting out just getting people used to talking to each other. But they definitely get at um, topics that students really care about. Um, they can feel really passionately about tradition and change. <laughs> so it's nice to kind of see how they fall along that spectrum. And so uh, this is just one example. You, you put these up and then, oh, do you feel more like this or do you feel more like this? And um, I know that we are living in the age of COVID and now we are all kind of wondering when we'll ever be able to do face-to-face -face instruction again. So I have a variation for remote instruction. If you want to try this remotely, um, you can do a Google Doc. So I'll kind of show you what I mean by that. So this is just a simple Google Doc. You can put your statements on either side. And then before you launch the activity, you want to make sure you have a little thumbnail of each person's face. And then you students can access the document and pick up and move their picture to where they want it to be. So that's an opportunity or an option for you to be able to do the same kind of activity in the remote space. After doing the values continuum, I'd always give students some uh, post-activity questions while their brains are really thinking about it to help them start reflecting on what they're learning about themselves and each other. 
Um, I might ask them questions like these. Do you think your stance on this value reflects the values of your larger culture, the larger culture that you belong to? Um, do you follow the rules, bend the rules, break the rules? And I think that uh, it helps students really see how dynamic culture really is, and they see it with their own eyes. They see, oh, I'm really similar to this person, and I didn't think I had anything in common with them. Um, or I'm surprised that we're not more similar. Don't we belong to the same culture, right? So it gives um, students an opportunity to really understand how we may align with or not align with the the preconceived ideas that we have about what happens, uh, what people are like in a certain culture. Um, Jen, would you like to talk about your experience with this activity? Sure, yeah, I've done this also with Dr. Bruce Rindler who teaches at Boston University and he often teaches the intercultural communication course. And most of the time there's predominantly 10 students from one particular national background and maybe four uh, domestic students, domestic being from the United States, uh, students mixed in one context. And when the students come into the course, a lot of them from that same national identity say that there's no reason for them to really take the course because they are all the same, meaning they're from the same country and therefore they have all the same exact cultural <laughs> uh, values. So this is a really dynamic activity that kind of teases apart where people are and the students can see for themselves that they're actually um, in these different pinpoints on this whole continuum. So it's a good way to see that we're all different even when we share the same national background that doesn't mean we're all of the same culture. It's also a good way to try to disrupt this idea of what a dichotomy is, right? It's almost like, let's lose the dichotomies. It doesn't have to be just left and right, right? Or black and white, but really getting into that gray area of what intercultural communication is. And yeah, that personal reflection can also take the form of the written journal as Sharon referenced, or also it's really great just to immediately after this activity great to get into groups of three, small, small groups, where you go around and even better if you have a, a group of students that were at different points on that continuum as they were doing the activity to really open and expand on their perspectives. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, so we only gave you three activities, but there are definitely more that you can find. Uh, TESOL's intercultural communication interest section, which I'm currently the community manager for, um, we just had a webinar about this great website uh, done by per Purdue University. It's called Hubacle. And it's a, it's a hub for intercultural learning. You can access it for free and um, they're not going to sell you anything. And you just, you can, it's a repository of intercultural learning activities that people around the world are contributing to. So you can contribute and you can see what other people have available. So if you're looking for other activities to do, I strongly encourage you to um, check out their website. Also take a look at that YouTube link um, that I have on this uh, slide because it is a webinar with the manager for this particular learning, um, for uh, the Intercultural Learning Hub. So um, she had a lot of good advice to share about searching and what you can use it for. Um, so finally, what are some other important considerations when developing and implementing intercultural activities? I'll just briefly talk about some of these instead of going um, in depth. So you want to think about some guidelines for structuring your intercultural learning. Uh, in the age of COVID, this is going to look very different than it would at, you know, in any other year. So when you're thinking about bringing learners together, maybe it's more possible to do now since everyone is doing Zoom. Um, but and it might use other remote learning educational tools. Um, but if you're gonna do uh, collaborative online intercultural learning, it is important to set expectations for mutual respect between the learners um, and model how to do respectful listening and to uh, actively support your students and make sure that, feel, that they feel safe to express their thoughts. 
And, uh, and then finally, you want to create activities for students to decide their level of engagement for if they want to be passive because they're not totally comfortable, there should be a path for them to pursue that. If they want to be more active, you know, allow them a way to do that. But you also want to make sure that if a person wants to contribute and can't get their words in, that there's some kind of mechanism in place to allow them to be able to gain the floor. Some other things to consider, um, Banesh has a great book about how emotions <laughs> are experienced in English language teaching and learning. So it's always important to attend to how your students are emotionally experiencing intercultural learning. Um, acknowledging that English for some uh, students is either an object of desire or it can be a mark of shame. Um, it sometimes, and, and that can make for using English to be a very conflicting experience for uh, some English learners. So um, anytime you're getting ready to do an intercultural learning activity, have conversations with your students about how it makes them feel <laughs> to use English, to interact with other people who are using English, whether, and, and not just, you know, native English speakers, because as we know, English is being used by people who are non-native speakers much more frequently than English is being used by native speakers. So it is far more likely that your students will be using English uh, with other uh, non-native speakers of English. Um, and finally, uh, a little word about intercultural learning. Um, in any intercultural situation, people are going to have expectations about who the other person is and what they're like before any words are ever spoken. So this is my friend Sam, and I show his picture to you. Um, you're already forming your ideas about who he is and what his life might be like. That's just human. That's just natural. It's the way our brain works. But as I reveal each of these pieces in, of information about him, your understanding of him changes. Who would have guessed that, right? So now being an interculturally competent person doesn't mean that you can predict that information. That's not what it means. Instead, being an interculturally competent person means that you're more aware of your expectations and you know how to remain open to accepting whoever the person is and however they present themselves. So interculturally competent people are able to pivot and build new frameworks for understanding cultural differences. And they do this by coming to the intercultural learning with open hearts and open minds. And as teachers, the best thing that you can do to encourage intercultural learning in your classroom is to model what that communication looks like when you come to it with an open heart and an open mind. And Jen is going to talk about our joint article. Yeah, so thanks uh, for attending our session today. It's really a pleasure uh, to have you here with us, even though we can't physically see you. Um, we encourage you to keep in touch. And one way to do that, we have two articles. One. Uh, was published by the New York TESOL Association in their idiom uh, newsletter. It's about promoting intercultural listening skills in a multicultural classroom. That same article appeared in the TESOL International Bilingual Basics newsletter. So you have two sources here uh, where you can read more about what we were talking about. And we also highlight some of these activities very explicitly at the end of the article. So you can also email us. Our contact information uh, is available on both of those articles. And here's a list of our references that we used today. And thanks a lot for attending. <laughs>